Good morning. It's the first day of November and we're going through the wisdom series and last week we talked about Solomon being wise in asking for wisdom. Now we want to glean through some of the wisdom he gained in the book of Proverbs. So Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 12 and then we're going to just kind of unpack and, and sift through these here. But Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh, and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions, and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father or the son in whom he delights. And this is the word of the Lord. Now, Solomon, you get a sample here of the, uh, the Proverbs here, don't you? But there's one little nugget there in the very middle that you probably recognize. It's very well known, well loved, and that's Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Let's look at those again, because that's where we're going to launch from there. And everything that's around it is either how to get to that point or what to do now that you're at that point. Okay? So let's look at this. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. And so the first thing there is to trust in the Lord. And because the opposite there, the, uh, the negative command that is in that is to lean not on your own understanding. We're going to pair those together here. So you can see that it's, it's to put your weight to lean into the Lord and not yourself. Now, in some ways, it's easy to say, well, yeah, that's, that's what I would do. But are we doing that for all of our life? Because that's what he says there, the word all, with all your heart. So it's not just with all your heart in one part of your life, but with all of your life. That we trust in him, trust in his words, in his ways. With all you have, with all that you are. Because the heart is the seed of your being. It's where the thoughts and feelings come from in the Hebrew mind. And so it's, it's there at your very core character. And so basing your life on God's word. In a dark world, you need light. And God's word is that light. In a place that is easy to get lost and, and to lose your way... This is our navigating beacon. This is not only that we may see, but also that we may know home, that we may know the way. And so he says, base your life on God's word. Dig deep, trust in the Lord with all your heart and not on your own understanding. Now, some of us, may not feel like we're the smartest kids in the class anyway. Some of us think we are the smartest kids in the class. But the reality is, is that all of us are being instructed to lean not in our own understanding. And I think as we walked with Solomon in his days, if you go in, uh, in the coming week and read through the rest of, of uh, First Kings, you'll see that that's what Solomon did. He heard less and less from God, and he walked in his own understanding. And even being the smartest guy of his time, he became a fool. He became a fool, and we're going to unpack that reason why. But it starts with, he was leaning on his own understanding. This is what is the best sense now and in this world. 
but that wasn't what was best. Outside of his mind, above the sun, as we will see in Ecclesiastes, and for eternity. The heart is deceitful, Jeremiah tells us. Even Solomon has Proverbs that, that give us that realization that we, we can't rely on it. It's tainted by sin. Our thinking is flawed. We can be deceived by ourselves. We will deceive ourselves. We can't trust our feelings. They're to be led, not to be our guide. They're unreliable at best. And truth be told, compared to God, we have a very limited knowledge. You may have the encyclopedia set memorized. Some of you are wondering what an encyclopedia set is. But uh, you may have Wikipedia memorized, but it's, you still have limited knowledge compared to God. You have limited perspective. You can't see the whole big picture. Truth is, we don't. You may have a better picture of the big picture than those around you, but you don't have the whole picture together. And you have limited experience. Even if you're 90 years old, you haven't experienced it all yet. And therefore, God says, don't lean on your own understanding, your own cognitive skills, on your own cleverness, on your own wisdom. It's going to fail you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And that's not just a, well, howdy God, and just go on your way. That is to know him. And it's that word for, as I understand it, a very intimate knowledge. It's to really get to know him. Because there's an interesting thing that drives a lot of people crazy, especially the seminary kids. And that is, the Bible isn't written as a theological treatise. It isn't. I can barely even say the word. It's written more as a biography, an annotated biography. It's telling the story. It's designed to be relational. Yeah. God wants relationship with us. Our religion is relational. There is religious aspects to Christianity and the worship of God. But at its core, it's designed to be relational. As God interacted with human beings. And our, our God, the true God, is not cold and aloof, just working the computer or or just the uh, the chess master working the the board no he interacts with us he is reactive to us even though he is timeless and eternal and unchanging he is reacting to us he's chosen to be that way and so the, the Bible reveals that these aren't just theological facts to understand but it is a biographical story. So I want to illustrate this in one way. What is Genesis, the starter of the Bible? It's a collection of interactive stories where God is interacting with these individuals like Adam and Eve, like Enoch, like Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, individuals. And we see God's priorities and 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 God's goals and what God is doing in these stories. Real stories and events that happen. Exodus. The first half of Exodus is God interacting with the nation through an individual named Moses. It's a biography. He eventually gets into some instructions for them in the last half of Exodus and Leviticus. and But even then, you know, in the book that's named Numbers... It's not about numbers as much as it's a bunch of stories with some instruction mixed in. And so God wants us to have an experiential knowledge of him. And with that, we'll be like those individuals in those stories and that we'll find that God is directing our paths. And that's a fun word because it's one that it's not just 
direct, go to the left, go to the right. But it is also, he will make your path straight. He will make your path smooth. He will always make it easy. Jesus himself said, difficult is the way. Narrow is the gate. But it is that he will make it plain, the path. It will be a well-trod path, is what that word says in that. Is that you'll know the way even if it is through the valley of the shadow of death. The shepherd is with you to make your path plain. Which then, as you see, as we've dealt with that Psalm 23, again, that relational aspect of being with God. But it is also, think about what does the New Testament start with? It starts with a collection of stories. Four letters, extended letters, biographical accounts of Jesus. We don't get the explanation till later with the apostles Paul and Peter and those things. But what's anchored in is a biographical account of God in our midst. And so God wants us to know us wants us to know him relation, relationally, relationally. And so the point in that is that God is less concerned about direction and more concerned about your priorities and principles. In our walk with Him, He's more concerned about what are our priorities and our principles than in our direction. So some of the big decisions we fret over the most are small because, yeah, they may affect the rest of your life, but do they affect your character? Your character is more important. And God is wanting that. And so, how does God do that? Well, that's what the first half of our reading deals with. Verses 1 through 4. So let's look at those for a second. So I'm glad you asked. My son, do not forget my law. Do not let your heart, or let your heart keep my commands. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. These are instructions to know God's word. Know what God has, has commanded in his instructions. Pop quiz. What is the first of the Ten Commandments? Now I know I said God is relational and he wants us to know him personally. But he did give his commands. So what is that first command? The second? I'm counting on you here. The third? See, one God, God first. You shall have no other gods before him. You shall not make idols. You shall not try to make God into what you want him to be. You shall keep the Lord's name holy. You shall remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You shall honor your mother and your father. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. How did you do? Did you know? If you didn't, just like that, then here's the reality. We're already failing at the first proverb. You've forgotten God's law, if you ever knew it at all. That's a problem, isn't it? We can't expect God to fulfill these promises if we're not wanting to know Him and what's important to Him. Let's make it a little easier here. What did Jesus say was the first and greatest commandment? What did He say was the second that was just like it? That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And that you love your neighbor as yourself. Do we know those? If they're not at the front of our mind, then they're going to get lost if they ever made it to the back of our mind. What did Jesus' new commandment that he gave to his disciples for us? That you love one another as I have loved you. Oh my goodness, that's a high command. How do I do that? I won't if I don't know it. And so it is 
essential that we hide his words in our heart. It doesn't matter if it's posted at the school or at the courthouse or, or at Congress if it's not posted in your heart, if it's not held tight. That in our reading with Jesus, we do we see his mercy? Do we see his, his truth? Do we see how he shows mercy to those who were, who were weaker and, and lesser than him? His enduring patience? Do we see his unflinching resolve to tell the truth? If we've forsaken those then we're fools. We don't know God. And so I plead. That's where we're at here. You'll notice I, I, 2 and 4, verses 2 and 4, those are the promises that go along with that. They're generalizations. They're not specific. But length of days, long life. You won't die foolishly if you do these things in meditating on God's words. You will be regarded well by God and by others if you're a person of mercy, if you're a person of truth. Doesn't mean you won't be oppressed sometimes for it, but you'll have friends. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. See, we thought we knew things that we don't actually know. It's important. Now, maybe you did get all of them fine. My apologies to you. But most of us are pretty fuzzy on those things. There's things that I caught myself in not remembering. I tried to recite to myself Psalm 1. Fail. Let's go back and look at it just for a second because it's just been a few weeks since we looked at it. Got the first verse, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. I couldn't get verse 2 quite right, and so I needed to get it straight in my head. If I'm not keeping it in the forefront of my mind, then it's getting lost. I had it memorized but it disappears. And so we need to keep working on those things. And that's going to be one of our application points here that we're going to get to in a minute. Now, let's keep moving because time is short. Let's go down there to verses 7 through 12. Three little chunks here. And again, they are counterintuitive. They're countercultural for sure in our present America. But they're important for us to remember. Because these are the things that are wisdom. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't be prideful in yourself. Keep your mind on God, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Flee from it. This is how to add health to even your physical body. It'll keep you out of trouble. But don't be wise in your own eyes. Beware of that arrogance. Because the fear of the Lord is the start of humility. Submit to God and you resist the devil and his temptations. Verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Countercultural, isn't it? The more you give to God, the better you will better shape you will be. At least if you're honoring God. Let me back that up. Not necessarily the more you give, but it is about honoring God. Giving to God and you will come ahead. Honor the Lord with what I have is His because He's the one who gave it to me in the first place. And even myself isn't me. It belongs to Him. The first fruits of all your increase and it's not just your profit margin it is your increase is what he is giving you you give him the first fruits so it's not just 
10%, it is 10% off the top, so to speak. You're giving him what is first. Give him what is best. Not just in my possessions, but that's what this is talking about, but then also in my time, my energies, my resources that I have here and here. Giving God those things. It's really fueled by gratitude. Do I have an attitude of gratitude? Because gratitude fuels God's generosity. And then lastly, again, counterintuitive. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. Oh no, not the hard times, not when God is, is correcting us. But instead, for us not to see God as the big, the big bad, but to see him as a loving father. Maybe we didn't have a loving father on earth, but that's the picture God wants us to have. And which is the reason why we, as parents, are to be an example for our children to know a loving parent. One who delights in their children. One who corrects with a goal of seeing them grow into a man or woman of God. Because he did, God doesn't want us to waste or despair the hardships that come in our life. He wants us to learn those lessons of dependence on Him. Because these are proof of the Father's love. And even a proof of his delight. And you want evidence of that. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, in whom I delight. God said at the baptism of Jesus. And what is the very next thing that God's spirit does? It leads Jesus into the wilderness. To fast and to be tested and to overcome. To bring victory. But it involved the test. The discipline of good doing without and depending on God. Now, you'll see in this that there's lots of good material in the Proverbs. We learned a lot of lessons here and about how to look at the hardships in our life, how to deal with the things that are in our pockets, and how to feel about ourselves, and really just kind of what we know. What are we putting into our minds? And so let's wrap this together with, now, today is the first day of the month when I'm recording this. November 1st, 2020. And while Proverbs is kind of hard to preach, it's really designed to be meditated on. It's really designed to just read through, ask God each day, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. And a chapter a day. Now, November only has 30 days, so when you get to December 1st, you'll have Proverbs 31 to finish. But a chapter a day. Each day, asking God, open my eyes that I might see wondrous things from your law. And reading through those Proverbs and seeing what pops, what stands out. Because something will. If we're looking for God to teach us through his word. And for those little wisdom nuggets then to be applied through our day. That's our homework. Because that's how we'll see God's hand in our, in his chastening, in his, in his uh, working in us as sons and daughters. That's how we'll be reminded to not be arrogant, but to, to have humility. That's how we'll see God directing our paths. More for character and less for direction. The direction will follow if the character is with God. Thank you for joining me in this. I pray that it gives you a hunger to know God better and to walk with him through his word. God bless, God keep you. We'll see you next time.